focus on big data has not been there at previous ESC conferences. And uh, this is something that uh, is very exciting from my point of view. Uh, there have been a number of other studies, uh, mostly negative, I must add, uh, in the field of cardiology. Uh, one that was published yesterday was the role of uh, defibrillators in uh, non-ischemic heart disease, and they found no significant improvement in mortality in those patients, and that adds to the argument in the role of defibrillators in heart failure and heart disease. Uh, another st important study was the role of uh, dual antiplatelet therapy, and I think one study from uh, uh, one trial that was published, uh, presented yesterday, has shown six months to be as similar impact of dual antiplatelet therapy to 18 months, and again, that led further controversy. Um, and another important study uh, wh which has been presented is looking at uh, clot retrieval in uh, patients with stroke. And in those patients, they have suggested that mechanical clot retrieval without uh, uh, sort of um, um, thrombolysis has been shown to be um, important. And this is something that's going to develop in future. So they, the Congress have dedicated a, a, an entire session to big data yesterday morning in which four of the uh, most important um, big data experts have spoken from across the world. And there are a number of abstracts that are being presented in this conference which focus and present the findings from big data. And in, in the past, we used to have studies um, mainly clinical trials, and also a few cohort studies that have selected to be presented at this conference. Uh, but it's really interesting to see that um, in, in this year's conference, a number of studies from big data, ranging from heart failure to uh, cardiogenic shock to sort of acute coronary syndrome, have been selected and are being presented. So it's extremely good to see that. So the ESC is five days, and uh, obviously over 30,000 um, cardiologists are visiting this place. And you have, I think, 50 or 60 concurrent sessions running at each time. Um, so it's very difficult to uh, attend all of them. Or it's impossible to attend all of them. But the ESC 365 is very good. So you can catch up on pretty much any session of interest to you after the conference or after it's done, in fact. So that's a very exciting thing. So you have to pick and choose what is most important for you and what you're uh, uh, most likely to want to see live. And the rest you can catch up on on the internet. Uh, from my point of view, obviously, the set talks that I'm giving, uh, I need to be there. And also the hotline sessions where the major trials and uh, um, events are likely to be presented. This is what I generally stick to because you get the news um, live, as it were. In this conference, we have seven abstracts that we are uh, presenting. Um, so this includes the big data talk that I gave yesterday morning. And uh, there's a press conference that I uh, presented at yesterday afternoon, which um, I looked at the role of readmissions in patients with heart failure from the UK. And we have shown that uh, patients who are being repeatedly readmitted to hospital with heart failure have significantly worse mortality and we have quantified that for the first time at an increased mortality risk of 2% uh, per each hospital admission. Uh, so that was very exciting. Uh, other data, other abstracts that we're presenting include um, something we presented on Saturday, looking at the role of atrial fibrillation and how it impacts mortality in heart failure. Another study looks at the role of the weekend effect in patients with heart failure, particularly when they're discharged at the weekend, they have, seem to have much worse mortality uh, than during the week. Um, this morning, we have presented on cardiogenic shock, where we have shown how cardiogenic shock trends um, have changed over the last 15-year period. And uh, cardiogenic shock as it is a very complex topic, as you may know. Um, but um, the prevalence of cardiogenic shock as a percentage of acute coronary syndrome seems to be the same or slightly increasing, and the patients are getting younger, um, and the mortality still remains high. So this is something that we need to focus on in future. Um, and we have other abstracts that we're presenting, including on cardio-oncology, so the role of 
sort of cardiovascular risk factors in the four most common cancers in the UK and how that impacts on mortality. That was presented yesterday and tomorrow we're presenting on the role of mental health conditions and how that impacts uh, recovery from heart failure. Um, and uh, we have shown that mental health conditions increase the length of hospital stay in patients with heart failure by approximately three days on average. So the ESC, uh, with it being so large uh, and it's so well attended, uh, has a significant amount of clout across the world, not only in Europe. And, and as such, it is uh, attended by many thousands of physicians from across the world. The ESC guidelines are pretty much the gold standard in how clinical practice is done, not only across Europe, but in many parts of the world. Uh, the guidelines are so extensive that they cover pretty much all the areas of general cardiology and physicians look to those guidelines in tricky cases and in case in day-to-day -day cases where they are faced by what do I do with this patient in front of me and what is the best available evidence. In 2016, when we have thousands of papers being published every day in thousands of journals, it's impossible for a cardiologist to read through all of that, so the guidelines help synthesize all that information and uh, inform the average cardiologist about what is the most important step and how to treat the patient in front of them. So I think there are some basic updating of guidelines, particularly in atrial fibrillation and heart failure. And from a clinical point of view, the updating of these guidelines uh, will inform the general cardiologist about how to take uh, a treat these particular patients. So that's very important. Uh, from a research and just generally looking forward point of view, I think the impact and the focus on big data and e-health has been very exciting. And I think uh, that, that will, the interest of big data and how that um, uh, sort of uh, grows over the next few years will be an important take home message. And I think we can see from all the sessions at ESC that at least one or two abstracts in all of the topics include uh, the results of studies from big data and uh, that's very encouraging to see and we'll see more of that in next year. So as I said, uh, it's a huge conference, you're not going to be able to attend everything. Uh, the, uh, the ability to pick and choose the topics that are going to have the biggest impact and that you want to know what's happening in real time, uh, that's something that you acquire over a number of years. But I think uh, if you stick to the main sessions with the hotline sessions, you can't go far wrong, uh, especially when you're coming to the ESC for the first time. Uh, and also, ESC obviously being 30,000 cardiologists, um, it's a great opportunity to network, uh, not only with um, sort of other uh, clinicians, but also industry leaders and uh, particularly research groups. So it, it provides an ideal platform to be able to develop your career, meet people, network, and also learn about cardiology. So you need to get the balance right between attending clinical sessions and developing your career, and that's what I tell. So the weekend effect is obviously a very big uh, topic in the UK for the last few years uh, and there have been a number of studies highlighting this. Um, we have done undertaken a significant amount of research in this field as well, particularly looking at heart disease and what our studies suggest is that the weekend effect is not a uh, blanket weekend effect for all conditions across all diseases. So particularly in some heart conditions, we find that patients being admitted to hospital at the weekend have worse mortality. Um, but in some other conditions, particularly not heart conditions, but sort of general surgical conditions and some other emergency conditions, there is no weekend effect exhibited at all. And where the weekend effect is exhibited, the, uh, the amount of weekend effect varies from condition to condition. So in some conditions, the mortality uh, disparity is only 2%, whereas in other conditions, it may be as high as 30%. So to say that the weekend effect exists for everything and we're gonna completely change the way healthcare policy and healthcare services are delivered across the spectrum is difficult. I think further research is required to highlight 
how much weekend effect there is in each individual condition and tailor service delivery change to that particular condition uh, rather than making blanket changes. And I think that's something I'd like to see going forward. And, you know, research is developing on this topic every day. And uh, I'm sure that uh, whilst the idea of service delivery change is there, this is what will eventually happen. So I think the first thing I would like to state and make clear is that statins are not a treatment for cancer at this point. But the research around the field is very exciting. Two years ago, some of our research, coupled with some basic science research from the US, has shown the potential role of high cholesterol in patients uh, in the development of breast cancer. So a basic science study has shown the development of breast cancer in, in mice with uh, high cholesterol. Um, and statins reversing that effect. Um, and we looked at that in a large clinical database, and we have shown that high cholesterol leads to, or is, asso is associated with the development of breast cancer. And this year, we have looked at the four most common cancers in the UK, and we, look, we have looked at how high cholesterol, which is treated, uh, and it, it impacts on the mortality of the four, four most common cancers. And we have found that uh, high cholesterol has improved the mortality in the four, four most common cancers in the UK. And this suggests a potential role of uh, statins in these cancers going forward. And, but this needs to be delineated in a clinical trial. Um, having said that, I think the time is right for a clinical trial and the overwhelming um, evidence around the topic suggests that we should go into a clinical trial for statins in various cancers um, sooner rather than later. This needs to be carefully planned and executed. So I think the, a clinical trial on statins is good and bad in many ways. It is good because statins are so widely available and there's an overwhelming majority of evidence to say that uh, they're relatively safe. I know they have their side effects and they are um, magnified somewhat in the media, uh, but uh, the overwhelming majority of evidence suggests that statins are relatively safe. And so from that aspect, uh, designing a clinical trial in patients with cancer using statins is something that can be done. Um, I know that there's significant amount of funding that potentially could um, be attracted because of statins, and that's because statins are now, most of them, off patent, and they're relatively cheap. Uh, so, you know, the, the designing a clinical trial with statins on cancer is both feasible, say, relatively safe, and potentially something that ca we can do. Um, now, the difficulties are how do you design such a trial in patients with, say, breast cancer who are a number of patients with breast cancer are very young and they may not have high cholesterol or, or cholesterol at all. So would, you know, how, why would patients with breast cancer who don't have high cholesterol, who are not used to taking medications, would they tolerate taking a statin every day? Would they tolerate the initial side effects or the perceived side effects? And would they be compliant? And also, what sort of benefits are we going to see? I mean, the, our data suggests that statins have overwhelming benefit. I think the observational studies suggest between 20 and 40 percent benefit. In a clinical trial, we are unlikely to see such a big benefit. Um, and the follow-up period of a statin trial needs to be carefully considered. If we're going to do it just for two years, we're unlikely to see significant benefits. And if we're going to, do, we should ideally do it for between three to five years. And the cost implications of following up patients in a clinical trial for this period are going to be potential challenges in this, in going forward into a potential clinical trial. But I think it is feasible, given that they're so, uh, you know, they're off patent and relatively cheap. So. The first thing to say about big data is that it's generally not collected. Big data research is algamated, and there's a big difference because collection of data for research purposes has been done for a number of years. And now people ask me, how do you collect data on millions of patients? And the truth is, you can't. 
it is impossible to go around with a paper and pen or even computers to go around collecting such millions of data. Now we have, uh, so particularly with ACOM, which is the data set that I w have established, I have written a program, an algorithm that uh, recodes routinely available data into a fully workable research database. So it's algamated rather than collected. So that gets around the practicality of collecting last, large volumes of data. Uh, now you ask what are the strengths and the weaknesses, and there are a number of weaknesses which are overcome by the strengths, but of course I'll be slightly biased about that, but, uh, and it's going to be a big argument going forward. The big weaknesses are that the routinely available data is about 80 to 90% accurate according to the latest validation studies. So it's by no means 100% um, because of clerical judgment, because of coding errors, etc. But we are getting better. And the reason I say we're getting better is because in the National Health Service in the UK, that's how we get paid. That's how hospitals get paid. And so, you know, if there are significant errors of coding, then the hospitals don't get paid accurately. So there are people looking at this uh, and monitoring how the coding works to significant amounts of detail. So that, uh, that also significantly improves the research quality. So, and that has been improving over the last 10 years. Now, yes, it's never going to be 100%, but equally, when you have millions of data sets, um, that is as much real life data as you're going to get. You're not going to collect this with the paper and pen. So if you want to have millions of data and work on it, this is realistically the only way we're going to be able to collect it. And you're not going to go and sit with each every individual person every time they're coding a single patient and say, this is how you do it. Practically, it's not possible. So it's never going to be 100%, but 80 to 90% is actually very good. And I think um, that's something uh, that we can take forward. So at the moment, we have been algamating big data data sets and been making correlations um, based on sort of trends in diseases, associations, and looking at outcomes, um, mostly for our observational purposes, say, and informing us about how clinical practice may change. What I would like to see in the next five to 10 years is the ability for big data to be analyzed in real time or close to real time to improve patient care in real time. So as the patient comes through the door, we algamate or we use all their previously available data and come up with scoring systems which can impact on how we treat that patient in front of us at that particular time. Um, it's slightly difficult to get your head around that, but imagine this. Um, for example, when I was coming to ESC, um, I went on the ESC website, I Googled it, and um, then I went onto YouTube, and suddenly the ads were giving me hotel options for Rome. So, you know, the fact that I searched for ESC, which was in Rome, had already been picked up by Google, and the analytics team have given me options for hotels in Rome, which I would search next. So that is real-time analytics working. And um, that, that's something I would like to see in healthcare. And I think that will uh, significantly improve um, the treatment of patients. One bit of caution, though, is that I'm not for, for every instance saying, uh, at any instance saying that big data is going to completely change how we treat patients and we're not going to have doctors at all. I think predictions and things based on what has happened is only possible and accurate to about 90, 95% of times. I mean, you can never predict when a patient may drop down dead in front of you. Um, no scoring system in the world is going to do that. Uh, so that's where I think clinical common sense and com uh, clinical acumen comes into it. So we're never going to be dispensing of doctors, but I think we should use these as um, clinical decision-making aids. And I think that there's a huge role to develop that. It's actually my anniversary today, and my wife has asked me to mention happy anniversary. So I'd like to say that, uh, otherwise she'll kill me when I get back to uh, England. And she's already asking me why I'm spending my time in Rome. <laughs> but I've told them that uh, I'm coming to see you lovely people and <laughs> give an interview about big data and uh, the ESC. 
but in all seriousness, big data is, um, is going to go forward in cardiology particularly. And let me tell you why in cardiology, because I think it's very important. Cardiology is a very evidence-based speciality. And the clinical trials, as I touched on earlier, are very expensive. And there haven't been that many breakthroughs in clinical trials in cardiology over the last 10 years, which are in keeping with the technological advances that we have seen in the last 10 years. And that's because of cost and the ability for pharmaceutical companies to recoup that cost that's spent on clinical trials. And this is where big data will come in to its own because the ability for big data to work with relatively low cost to provide long-term outcomes data is huge. And also we face an aging population in the Western world. And a lot of the clinical trials do not include patients above the age of 80. And so now you have patients about 80 coming in regularly. So you cannot really extrapolate the results of clinical trials for these patients. And again, that's where big data will allow us to make informed decisions.